Well, it is officially 8.30 and I might dive in, even though it's just you and me so far, Brian, and we'll see if anybody else trickles in. Yeah, go for it, man. Yeah, um, this is probably all going to be um, a lot of review for you, not much new. So the series will be targeted at um, new boaters um, or, or people interested in, in joining the boating community. Um, as I'm recording this and it will be posted online, I'll, I'll, even though Brian, you know everything about Penyon more than I do, um, I'll still go through the, uh, the whole introduction anyways. Um, so this, uh, this is part one of a three-part series aimed at new boaters. And uh, um, it's hosted by uh, Banyan Yacht Club and Marina. Um, so let me just dive into my slides here. Hopefully, can you see my screen, Brian? Uh, no, I don't see your screen yet. No. Oh, you don't see the slide that I'm sharing? No, I can. Oh, yes, down the bottom. Yeah. Let, okay, there. Yeah, I don't see you when I'm on the slide. Yeah, oh. I switched. Yes, I can. Yeah. I'm good. It's a better view. The slides are a better view anyways. Yeah, so. that's, yeah. That's, that's a brilliant slide, that first one. Yeah. Wow. Um, so uh, title of this um, of today's seminar is Boating Basics. So it's an intro into apps and hardware um, and some uh, great resources for those that are just uh, diving into the marine community. Um, as Benyon is located in Cape Breton, um, a lot of the examples that I'll give and a lot of the, the uh, um, all of the photos that I'll share are all from the uh, Bredore Lake um, and the area here. Um, and no matter where you may end up watching this from, I know a few people uh, showed interest uh, for this um, down in Halifax. There's the same types of communities and resources there. Um, and the emphasis uh, sort of underlying all of underlining all of this will be um, to make sure that you make connections with uh, with local folks, local communities, um, and reach out to people to see what local resources there are. Uh, so before we dive into the actual topic, I just want to give a, a little overview um, of Benyon Yacht Club um, as uh, we're hosting this series. And uh, it's an opportunity opportunity for me to shamelessly plug our, our beautiful marina. Um, so just a little bit about Benyon. Uh, so Benyon is located on the shores of the Bredore Lake in East Bay, uh, the Bredore Lake being Canada's big inland sea. Um, and it's approximately a 25 minute drive out of Sydney, so very close to the city. Um, and uh, one of the great things about the Bredore Lake, we only get between six and eight inches of tide um, and no swell to speak of. Uh, so even though it's uh, salt water or brackish water, um, it's quite protected compared to uh, some of the more exposed bays and a beautiful place to have a boat. Um, so Benyon Yacht Club and Marina is a nonprofit organization. Um, and really our, our, our goal is, is to preserve and enhance marine activity in Cape Breton um, and to support those activities and, and the growth of those activities. Um, we are primarily volunteer driven with a volunteer board. Um, and we do have our general manager, John, that works at the clubhouse uh, full time all summer, actually more than full time. He seems to always be there. Um, but the vast majority of all of the uh, events, uh, event planning um, and, and all the logistics um, are generally run by volunteers, Brian, you being one of the main ones. Um, so we offer a wide variety of summer activities, including weekly keelboat racing. Uh, we do poker runs, several social events, not so much this year because of COVID, um, but in a usual year there would be. Um, the East Bay Regatta being our big regatta that we hold every year. Um, and this year we also held a, uh, a turkey bowl at the end of our fall race series. Um, skill building workshops that we uh, host every so often. Um, and of course our junior sale program um, and many more and more to come in 2021. Um, but most importantly, Benyon Yacht Club and Marina is a community of dedicated enthusiasts um, that are here and friendly and uh, want to be available to help anybody get started um, in, the, in the marine community. Um, and I, just a shameless plug here, uh, we do have a marine, a new marine membership special uh, that's going on. So it's, it's only a dollar plus the joining fee uh, to become a new marine member. Um, and you can contact uh, John through the website um, if, uh, if you're interested. 
Um, and a little bit about me, um, just so you know who's talking at you. Uh, so I'm Andrew Hamilton. I've only been boating for about uh, six years now. Uh, my wife and I and our four-year-old son have a 31-foot uh, Beneteau, and uh, we, uh, none of us, had uh, um, stepped foot on a boat prior to getting our first boat, a J30, six years ago in Halifax. Um, so the first few seasons of sailing were kind of a crash course in what to do and more importantly, what not to do. Um, and so that, uh, that experience that I had and sort of weeding through um, the many options that are out there led to the creation of this, uh, this first part in the series. Um, and so hopefully arming uh, new boaters with some of the tools that they might want and need uh, to get them out on the water quickly and safely um, and in an economically friendly way. Um, I'm sure everybody has seen prices of uh, marine um, hardware and software, and it's not always uh, friendly to the wallet. Um, so these are, today we'll focus on some, uh, some great tools that you can add to your tool belt, get out safely, um, have a good time uh, without breaking the bank, while you sort of explore what, um, what specific hardware and software you'd like to invest in um, as you get more comfortable on the water. Um, okay, so why talk about apps, websites, and hardware? Um, first and foremost, I mean, the, the prevalence of, of the use of technology is, um, has permeated pretty much every aspect of society, and it's only growing. Um, across the Bedore Lakes, we have fairly good cell phone and GPS, uh, GPS reception, and that's true the whole way down the coast of uh, Nova Scotia as well. Um, and in fact, when my wife and I brought our boat up this summer, um, I think we lost cell signal for maybe 15 minutes the entire uh, trip up the coast. Um, so really uh, the access to uh, internet uh, through cell phone and, and GPS is quite available. Um, apps can be really powerful tools to assist in planning a safe and fun outing. Um, and they can also be um, great tools, great reminders for logging important boat data, such as number of hours you've run your engine, um, how far you've traveled, how fast you've traveled, um, uh, things like that. So you know when to do maintenance uh, and, and sort of keeping track of um, fuel consumption and, and any of those, those types of data points. Um, and more importantly, um, these are, are just another tool in your tool belt to responding to situations that may, re may arise unexpectedly. Um, and that could be anything from an engine malfunction to um, a change in the weather and, and you need to quickly find a, a safe spot to tuck into for a little bit or uh, um, a place to drop your anchor down or something like that. Um, so apps, uh, apps and, and technology has really come a long way for adding so many tools to our tool belt. Um, but I do want to highlight that apps are developed really for a global audience. There's not a lot of locally developed and managed applications. Um, and so while they are a really great starting point, um, I would encourage everyone to look for further local resources, and that could be people or websites or Facebook groups or anything like that, um, that augment the data that you can get from apps. Um, so apps are a really great starting point, and we'll talk about some specific ones here tonight. Um, but they're only the first step in making sure that you're well equipped uh, to have a safe and fun time on the water. Um, so uh, just an overview of what we're actually going to talk to uh, talk about tonight. And I have a lot of slides, but don't let that scare you. I'll start to plug through them really quick here. Whoops, I went too fast. Um, I'm trying to move this out of the way here. So what we're going to cover tonight. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of local and useful websites. Um, so uh, st talking specifically about marine forecast, um, I want to highlight the Cape Breton, Breton Weather Masonettes, um, as well as I'll talk about some Facebook groups that I'd encourage folks to uh, to, to look up and, and, and like. Um, but uh, of course, Facebook is full of different uh, different groups and organizations that uh, that you can search for. Um, and then the apps that we're going to talk to specifically about tonight are Navionics, Race Cues, Windy and Predict Wind, 
Boat Beacon, and Anchor Pro. And these all do, except for Windy and Predict Wind, are both weather uh, applications, but they have very unique features that I wanted to highlight both of them. Um, but all of these do wildly different things. So Navionics kind of being the premier navigation app. Uh, Race Cues is a really great um, tool for yacht racing. Um, and really cool features. Uh, and I'll talk about that one last. Windy and Predict Wind being really important apps that can help you uh, look at the weather, um, see what's coming um, and plan your, your trips accordingly. Um, Boat Beacon being a, a app-based AIS uh, software. And we'll talk about what AIS is uh, later on and Anchor Pro. Um, and there's Anchor Light, which is a free version, um, which is just an anchor alarm to uh, help you sleep soundly. Uh, or in my experience, not so much, but uh, uh, we'll get into some stories later on. Um, so right before I, I dive into the apps, uh, I just want to make a couple notes about safety. Um, whoops, I keep clicking forward here. Uh, so the first one is GPS accuracy. So uh, we've come to rely very heavily on uh, on technology to be kind of a crutch that, that we lean on when we need it. Um, and while I will stay, say that uh, um, boating hardware, such as your chart plotter from Ray Marine or something like that, B&G, um, they do have additional uh, hardware within them that make the GPS signal extremely accurate um, down to within, I, I think it's um, something like 10 feet, uh, 10 foot radius. Um, but when you're using your cell phone or an iPad or something like that, the GPS is far less accurate, um, and we're talking uh, a potential discrepancy of about 50 meters. Um, and if you look at, um, for example, like home security apps that would use geolocation to automatically arm or disarm your home security system, they usually set a radius from your home of about 300 feet um, because of these known inaccuracies in GPS. And you can imagine in the middle of the Bredore Lakes, 300 feet doesn't really mean much. Um, but if you're heading into a narrow channel uh, where there might be some hazards in the water, you might be in a low visibility area, um, 300 feet makes a huge difference. Um, so be sure that you know, you're checking your phone, you're checking your GPS, you know where you are, but you're also using um, all other means that you have to keep a, a safe eye out um, because while it is extremely accurate most of the time, you can find yourself um, 50 to 100 feet in the, in the, wrong, uh, the wrong area. Um, second note about safety, um, along the same lines, um, this is a beautiful photo of uh, my friend uh, Craig's boat, the Kraken, CNC 36. Um, we're just leaving Prospect Bay and in behind him is the entrance to Rogue's Roost. Um, where there were four boats we rafted up for the night. It was an absolutely beautiful evening. My son, who is uh, one and just over one, uh, yeah, just over one, I think, at the time, um, dropped my phone into our bilge, which had just a small amount of water. Um, and I learned very quickly that uh, technology, especially um, apps on cell phones and, uh, and GPS, is not weatherproof. Um, and so we quickly found ourselves in a situation where we no longer had Navionics available to us. Um, and luckily we had fantastic weather for getting back to St. Margaret's Bay the next day. So it wasn't so much of an issue and we had a whole flotilla of boats with us. Um, but just to keep that in mind, that technology is not infallible. Um, it can fail, uh, rain, um, weather or children um, can certainly uh, throw a bit of a wrench into your plans. Uh, so useful websites. I'm just going to go through a few here. The first one being actually our club website, but it's not the be-all end-all. Um, so if you go to benyonmarina.com, you'll see where I've highlighted in red there um, on just the main, uh, the main head there, the weather station. And if you click into the weather station, this weather station is actually located on the break wall at Benyon Yacht Club. And I'll speak to why I'm highlighting this in a minute. Um, but this is one weather station and a whole network of weather stations across Cape Breton um, that is all kind of pulled together by the Cape Breton Weather Masonettes. Um, and they have a wonderful Facebook page. And, and I do want to highlight that. I would really encourage everybody to look up their Facebook page, follow it. Um, not only do they provide really great weather updates, but they uh, also uh, periodically 
just talk about some really fascinating weather phenomena um, that happens across Cape Bretons, little sweat winds. Um, we had uh, uh, an atypical northwest wind blow through East Bay one day and blew all the warm water out of the bay. And they talked about this uh, thermal recycling effect and, and how it changes the water temperature. And, um, and it made, us, made me anyways realize how lucky we are in East Bay uh, to have the wind predominantly blowing into East Bay where we get uh, extremely warm water all summer, um, well over 20 degrees for, for the majority of the summer. Um, but some really important information on, on this website, and I, I couldn't capture the whole screen on the screenshot, um, but it also has a graph of wind speed and wind direction um, that I believe goes back uh, four to six hours um, in time. But here you can see temperature, um, you can see that uh, um, there's water temperature. Um, and most importantly here, you see two minute, 10 minute wind speed. Um, and this, you can see I was making these slides very last minute. This was at 5.30 today that I uh, grabbed this off of the, the website. Um, but really great information. It's up to date, it's current. You can just hit refresh. And really every time before I head down to the boat, I'm uh, down to the marina, I usually just check this out to know what I can expect when I get there. Um, yeah, so I would, again, I'd encourage you to uh, to look up the Facebook page, give it a like, as well as check out the whole uh, Cape Breton Weather Masonette um, network. There's a lot of really great information, a lot of really great people, um, dedicated people, um, and uh, um, certainly worth following. Um, the other main website that, uh, that everybody knows, and there's an app associated with this that I personally don't use that much, but I know a lot of people do, um, through, uh, through the marine forecast, whether uh, the, the uh, federal government um, website. Um, so you can just search marine forecast Bredor. Um, unfortunately, weather forecast have ended for the Bredor Lake, so I couldn't do a capture from there. Um, but this is the Eastern shore. Um, and what you can see here is they, uh, they talk about wind, and sea state, um, as well as they give you an extended forecast. Now, one thing I do want to note is that the Bordeaux Lakes, we do not get this extended forecast. Um, so even when the weather forecasting comes back in, in, uh, um, in the springtime, you won't see beyond today and tomorrow's forecast um, on the marine forecast. Uh, for the Bordeaux Lakes specifically, you do see it for all of the um, coastal areas around Cape Breton, but not within the Bredore Lakes. The other thing that you won't uh, you won't see on the Bredore Lake forecast is uh, is wave height, um, and that's simply because we we are just really not affected by ocean swell uh, within the lakes at all, um, outside of the entrance to the Big Bredore Channel. Um, now, this is a, a really great um, resource to go to to say what is the weather supposed to be. Um, today, tomorrow, maybe for the next few days, especially if you're planning a longer outing. Um, but I do want to highlight a, a maybe a little known fact um, about the, uh, the weather updates. And specifically, I'm sure that uh, everybody has experienced frustration where what they see for weather prediction is not actually what they experience when they get somewhere. And uh, Marine forecasting follows an extremely rigorous uh, set of rules for how they, uh, when they provide forecasts, um, how everything is, is stated within the forecast, um, as well as uh, when they'll actually update that forecast as uh, conditions change. Um, and so I wanna highlight here, when wind speeds are below 60 knots, if the highest sustained wind speed uh, is observed or is expected to differ from the forecast wind speed by 10 knots or more, they will update the forecast. Meaning, if you have a wind forecast of 15 to 20 knots gusting to 25, and in reality, there are gusts well over 30 knots, there will not be an update because there is not a sustained wind speed increase of 10 knots or more. Similarly, if you have a wind forecast of 15 to 20 knots and the actual sustained winds are 28, 30 knots, until it goes over that 30 knot threshold, there will not be an update to the forecast. And this is a really important distinction to make because the difference between 20 knots, which would be a fairly sporty uh, sail, 
or 30 knots, which is entering the, uh, the beginning of gale force territory, um, vastly different, vastly different conditions, but you would not necessarily see an updated forecast on the marine forecast. Um, and so this is why I say that it's not just about having the right app or the right website to go to, but really looking at a community of knowledge and comparing everything and say, and making a really good um, uh, connection to say, you know, this is the forecast. This is what I'm seeing on this website or on this app. And so I think realistically, this is what I can expect when I get out there. Um, so with that said, I want to highlight specifically the Windy app. Um, and what I love about the Windy app first and foremost is that it's free. Um, this is a screenshot from my cell phone with the Windy app. You can see Sydney, Badek, Waikagama, Bordeaux Lake, um, and you can see all these little pins around there. Um, it shows you wind speed, shows you wind direction. Um, again, this is based on larger models. So while you can drill down as close as you want to East Bay, um, Windy does not, uh, does not model specifically in East Bay. And this is where I'm gonna start to tie together some of these resources. So specifically what I really, really like about Windy outside of the fact that it's free is that it actually shows the local weather stations and it shows what the current conditions are at those weather stations, as well as if you use their, uh, if you play forward through the, the prediction for how the wind is going to change, you can see what the predicted wind speeds are at those stations. So the one that I have here on the screen is actually earlier today, um, the, uh, the actual uh, weather station that's on um, the break wall there at East Bay. So part of that weather masonette. And you can see here North Side East Bay. And even within St. Andrew's Channel um, and East Bay here, you can see there's at least two more stations there. And there's several across the lakes. And one thing that you'll realize really quickly when sailing in the Bredore Lakes is that what you experience in one part of the lake, weather-wise and wave-wise, is not what you will experience necessarily in another part of the lake. Um, so what I really like about this is that it's an app that shows you what the predicted forecast is, um, but that it actually does link you directly to these weather stations that you can see what the real uh, weather conditions are. Um, and so, for example, on this last slide, you see here down in East Bay, 4.3 knots, kind of in a, I guess, an east southeast direction. Um, and then up here in St. Peter's, we have uh, a more, um, southwest direction and a knot less. And this was taken at the exact same time. Um, and it looks like actually they're using two different uh, weather models, but that's all right. Um, so what I like to do is, especially if I'm leaving East Bay and heading across the lake, I would look at the marine forecast. I would also look at uh, windy um, and I would uh, actually query all of the different weather stations along my route to say, you know, what is the changing conditions as I head out of East Bay and into the lake? And can I expect more wind, less wind, relatively the same? Um, is it matching what I'm seeing on the prediction from Windy? Um, so I would, I would sort of go through all of those steps. And that's where I'm starting to say that it's, uh, it's great to go to one resource. It's better when you go to multiple resources and you tie together local resources with these more uh, large scale uh, predictive models. Oh, I forgot to, uh, or maybe my slides didn't show there. Um, I must move that around. Predict Wind is the premier, is certainly the premier web app. I'm not sure what happened to my slides here. Um, I might have to come back to that. Yeah, um, I don't know what happened to my pictures. Uh, they should be here, but they're not. Um, essentially, Predict Wind offers a whole different way of looking at um, weather data, and I'll just, I guess, uh, verbally describe it to you. Um, but uh, you can pull up the, the same type of weather map, but also you can pull up um, a graph that shows you the three um, most used and most trusted weather models um, that would show the forecast for any given area that you're looking at. And you're able to see what the discrepancies are between those three forecasts. Um, and sometimes you have wild discrepancies between the three models. And that would that would sort of indicate that ooh, maybe they don't really have a good handle on what the forecast is. But more often than not, the models are extremely close together 
which um, can tell you that, you know, with a fair degree of certainty, um, you can expect the conditions that they're predicting. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight with predict wind, it's not available in the free version, but in the paid version, you can actually get route planning. So if you're going to be doing a longer trip, maybe down the coast a ways, um, that they will actually, you can you can send them the data on your boat, uh, the point of sail you like to go at, the average speed, um, the conditions you would you would prefer to sail in. Uh, if you have a bigger, heavier boat and you need you know a good 15, 20 knots to get it moving, um, or a, a more tender boat that you really don't want to go above 20 knots. Uh, if you want it on the beam uh, or more on the stern, um, predict wind and the team can actually work with routing a uh, passage plan for you so that you get the best weather conditions um, that you would want um, for for your passage. Um, and so that's a really fascinating, very cool feature. Um, and as I mentioned, predict wind really uses, they use the three um, main models for, for weather predictions globally. Um, so their, their modeling is extremely accurate. And that's a really great tool that you can sort of pay for a month of, of service, um, do your passage, um, and, and have a fair degree of confidence in, in what they're going to be predicting. Um, yeah. So a final note about safety. Uh, the reason we started with weather, uh, weather by far um, can have the greatest effect on uh, conditions. And uh, this is a, a video I took from the helm this summer. Uh, we were um, heading, we left Maskell's Harbor um, and we were heading for St. Peter's. And uh, as I mentioned, there's a discrepancy between, um, there can be a huge discrepancy between what uh, the marine forecast from the government website tells you versus what you're actually experiencing. So the marine forecast for this day was 15 to 20 knots um, and uh, uh, with gusts uh, to 25. Um, and sustained, I would say that, uh, that we were right on the nose um, upwards of 28, 29, 30 knots. Um, it was a cold, wet, uh, uncomfortable ride um, and uh, had, the, had the, uh, um, the weather prediction been a little bit more accurate, I may have enjoyed another night in Maskell's Harbor, but as it was, it was, a great, uh, it was great to get to St. Peter's and have a warm, uh, warm meal. Um, okay, so we're going to switch gears here. We've talked a little bit about weather. Um, I guess before I do, um, Brian, I don't know if you had any questions or wanted to add anything to what I've said so far um, before I move into navigation. Uh, no, I just the one thing about uh, you were mentioning the GPSs and the cell phones. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, on some of the cell phones, I don't know if it's just the apps you buy or the cell phone, the GPS and the cell phone itself. It'll actually use the towers and triangulate your GPS and merge them to give you a better number. Yes. Yep. Um, so cell phones, uh, I think it's GLONASS is the acronym for it. That, that's, um, that's the Russian, that's the Russian GPS. That's the Russian satellites, the GLONASS. Is GLONASS? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yep. Yeah. Um, we have, for example, we have an iPad that can accept a SIM card, um, yeah. but we don't have a SIM card in it. So it does have GPS, um, yeah. but it, it's not as accurate as it would no. be if we had the SIM card and it could use no, a cell tower. That's right. that's right. But once you yeah. get the cell towers, it can be, uh, anyway, I, I, I'll tell you another thing, not in this, I'm not in this form, but a, a little experiment I did with a handheld GPS and, and the, uh, and the, Cell, I mean, and my cell phone and my iPhone and okay. the iPhone was more accurate to known points actually oh that's great okay yeah yeah um yeah, yeah it's uh I, I took um was it last summer I think it was last spring I took the uh like at the blue water survival course yeah um and that was one of the things they highlighted and that was there was a, a famous wreck where I, th I believe several of the sailors actually died because they cut too close. They were following the GPS too close to a shoal marker Yeah, and uh, ran aground. Um, and the GPS just, yeah, it was, it was off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that that's an instance of, uh, I think 
for all of the sailing that I've done in the Bordeaux Lakes, I, I don't think that I've ever been, my phone has never told me that I'm in a different place than I actually am. No, no. Um, and and that, that's my experience as well. Uh, yeah. Um, it's just one of those things to keep an eye for, to verify, exactly. yeah. especially if it's foggy or something like that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to make sure that you see the markers where they should be. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I know the first couple of years of sailing, my eyes were glued to Navionic. <laughs> yes. Um, and it, it uh, you have to build a degree of confidence to actually look around you and say, you know, what I'm seeing on the chart, is it actually what I'm seeing in front of me? Um, and starting to build that situational awareness too. Especially in the fog. Especially, yeah, especially in the fog. <laughs> yeah, you won't see anything around you then. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, it's I been think, great so far. No, it's great. That's wonderful. All right. Well, I'll keep going. Um, yep. I think I've only seen fog once on the Brewer Lakes, and that was way yeah. up by Marble Mountain. Yeah. All right. So switching gears here to marine navigation. Um, so um, I do have up here on the, the screen in front of me uh, a, screen a screen grab from the binnacle. Um, and so this is a cruising guide to Nova Scotia and somewhere right here beside me, um, I have a very old version of that. Um, and I know that, uh, they offer a couple different, uh, book versions. Um, so again, I just want to highlight the importance of, um, that apps are very powerful tools. There's a lot of data that you can get from them, but, um, it's also important to, um, look for um, look for local resources as well. So the Cruising Guide to Nova Scotia, uh, I think my next page here actually has a photo of it. You can see here, they go into a lot more detail about um, the specific places that you can pull into. So for example, I was just talking about fog in Marble Mountain. Um, they actually describe what you should see. Um, they often will, will provide little maps of the harbor. Uh, they might give depths and whatnot. Um, so where Navionics is a, is a really great quick look, um, especially uh, in the Bredore Lakes, there's a few anchorages that have uh, fairly shallow water to get into. Um, it's worth going into a, a resource like this, giving it a quick read, maybe talking to some locals and saying, you know, how accurate is, G is uh, Navionics here? Um, how much can I trust this? Uh, what are some things to be aware of? Um, and I'll actually talk about how you can get a lot of that information from Navionics as well. Um, one of the things I really, really like about the, uh, the cruising guides um, is they certainly offer um, a lot more insight into some of the really great stops that you can, uh, that you can go to around uh, Nova Scotia, all the way around Nova Scotia. Um, of course, I'm, I'm focusing this talk about uh, the Bedora Lakes. Um, but uh, but really, I know that the price tag is big at seventy five dollars a, a book. Um, but my book is, uh, I think, from the nineties um, and still fairly accurate, actually, for the Bedore Lakes. Anyways, um, I certainly wouldn't use it as a as a bible in um, um, any type of hazardous waters. I'd look for more up to date information. But in terms of what to look for and what to see in in different places and actually where these harbors are. Um, with Navionics, you'd really have to scroll around the edges of the map and hopefully start to pick up these where a guidebook will actually just lay out all of the different anchorages that you could see in a different area. Um, and then you know where to go and look on, on the uh, Navionics app. Drop a pin if you think you'd like to visit it um, later. Okay, so... With that said, I want to dive into Navionics, uh, which is certainly the premier navigation app. Um, there are a couple of free apps out there, and I will tell you that the um, maps themselves are not nearly as accurate, um, and they don't have as, as much robust tools with them. Uh, Navionics comes with a bit of a, a hefty price tag in terms of what uh, apps cost, um, but well worth uh, uh, if you're going to spend any money on something. Um, Navionics is, is, the, is the app to get. Um, so three main things when you get into Navionics that I really like to highlight um, and, and uh, 
this is because I've made all of these mistakes myself. Um, and I'll tell a story in the next slide here. Um, so once you have Navionics downloaded and you're in the app, there are three things that I would really encourage everybody to do. Number one, add your boat settings in. So you can just go into the settings screen, you can add in your draft, your uh, um, beam, the length of your boat, um, your cruising speed, typical cruising speed, how much fuel you use per hour, um, and how what the offset is for your depth sounder. That is a, a really, really uh, important thing to do um, as soon as you're into Navionics, um, especially if you're gonna be using their auto route feature. I think the default is a 10 meter draft. So uh, especially some of the anchorages around here, you would never be able to auto route anywhere because 10 meters is an insane amount of draft. The second thing I wanna highlight Download the maps before you leave the docks. So this, uh, the, the screenshot there on the upper far right, um, you can see the lighter um, map area um, is actually the, the map portion that's been downloaded and the areas around it have not been downloaded. Now I mentioned at the beginning that there is really good cell reception all around the coast of Nova Scotia and throughout the Bredore Lakes. Um, but I can also tell you that there are a lot of absolutely gorgeous anchorages down the coast of Nova Scotia and within the Bredore Lakes that you will not get any cell reception at all. Um, and so if your phone is shut down and you turn it back on, maybe you're trying to save power for a night on the hook and you've not downloaded that app or downloaded the map itself um, and, and the cache is erased, you won't have access to that. Um, and one of the common misconceptions about GPS is that it will tell you your coordinates it does not tell you coordinates. If it doesn't have um, GPS kind of reads where you are on a geosphere, but if you do not have some type of reference data to lock that in with, um, such as the map for Navionics that's downloaded to your phone, you will just be a dot on a white page and it will mean not much until you get it back into cell reception. Um, the last thing I wanna highlight is community edits. Navionics is more than just a navigation app. It's actually a whole community of boaters that, that build and add to, the, uh, um, add to the software over time. So turn on, I would encourage everybody to turn on community edits. Um, community edits would be like this yellow dot right here, um, shoaling just outside of uh, Orangedale. Um, and so that might be, people may just add in that over time, um, the map is not accurate. It's not accurate. Uh, there may be an additional hazard um, that could be that you know an area has has filled in over over time, or um, that perhaps there's a a new overhead power line or something like that. Um, community edits are a really really powerful tool, um, but more importantly than community edits, um, and I will talk about this as well that that my chart plotter also runs off of uh, Navionics. Um, but my chart plotter, I don't update as frequently as just having my phone that is constantly updating. So I won't necessarily get my community edits all the time on my chart plotter, but I will get it on my phone. Um, so I learned this summer definitely to check my phone as well when I'm getting into more hazardous waters to make sure that there aren't any community edits that I need to be aware of. Um, so this is a shot here. Um, of, uh, of our boat Barrel Rider and a uh, friend's boat Incognito tied up to the dock in, uh, in Orangedale. Um, and uh, we were just making our final approach to the passage into Orangedale and I happened to glance down at my depth sounder. And we went from six feet down to four feet, down to two feet, down to 0.6 feet. Um, and even though my chart plotter was telling me I should have six feet under the keel the whole way through, uh, that was obviously not accurate. Um, and luckily we were able to uh, uh, do hard astern and, and turn the boat over before we hit a shoal. Um, but in speaking with our friends on Incognito that night, they showed me the community edits feature and a very good lesson was learned that could have been a, uh, a much more painful night stuck on a sandbar than uh, tied up alongside an Orangedale. Um, so community edits, definitely turn them on. Um, the other thing I would encourage is that if you're going to use Navionics, you create an account um, that you can actually leave community edits as well. So if you see something that 
um, other boaters should be aware of. You just add it to the map um, so that we start to grow this database that is accurate um, and updated frequently. Um, so I mentioned the guidebook, I mentioned locals, um, but Navionics again is so much more than just a navigation app. It really is starting to build a community of experts. Um, and so what, I, what I've shown here is that, uh, so this is for example, Island Point Resort, really beautiful spot um, in, in, the, uh, in the Northern Basin. Um, and so you can see here, um, we have photos, you have all of the contact information, um, phone numbers, emails, um, the bridges, for example, they'll give you the channels to call bridges on um, or phone numbers um, sometimes. Um, they'll tell you what amenities are available at different, uh, um, different stops. Um, so what you can expect when you get there. And most importantly, they allow folks to leave um, reviews. Um, and so my wife and I and our son tied up for a night at Island Point this summer, and we were the first boat um, to, uh, to stop there after he added it as a destination, and we left a review. It was an absolutely lovely spot. I'd certainly encourage anybody to go there. Um, but we tried to, to leave some useful information uh, about uh, you know what the depth is trying to get into the dock. We draw six feet. We couldn't quite get there. Um, that there are moorings. You know what uh, what we experienced um, that will add to the information that all of these stops are adding. So Navionics definitely must have. Um, what I like to do is compare what I read in the uh, in the cruising guide to what the reviews are that folks have left on the uh, on the Navionics uh, pages. And the other thing that I like to pay attention to, Navionics is a fairly old application now. Uh, not old in the sense that it's redundant. It's extremely up to date. Um, but some of the uh, some of the reviews that you'll find on there are several years old. Um, and as as we know, especially in Cape Breton, uh, communities change quite a bit um, or have changed quite a bit in the last few years. So just take everything on there with a little bit of a grain of salt and do some research before you uh, make a big plan and then find out that maybe something's a bit different. Um, so just a last little note here about Navionics. They do allow auto routing, tracking records, and any pics that you take while Navionics is tracking your sale in the background, it will organize it all in sort of a route summary at the end of it. Um, so they'll tell you that you can do auto routing. Uh, I don't always use it, but it's it's good for a quick, uh, how long is it gonna take me to get to where I'm going, where my destination is tonight. So it'll tell you approximately how long it'll take you, um, how much fuel you might use. Um, and what I really like about it is when it is auto tracking you, um, it will tell you things like your top speed, your average speed. And if I snap any photos along the way, it'll just organize all of that. So when I go back and do my, my, uh, my log at the end of the day, um, it's a really great way to sort of jog your memory and say, what did we see today? What did we experience today? How fast were we going? What was the wind conditions? Um, so what it does not do, what Navionics does not do is local weather and tides. Um, and I wanna make just a quick note about tides before we uh, move on to, uh, I think it's race queues coming up next. Um, so what will the current be doing? Uh, on the Bredore Lakes, this is a fascinating uh, tidbit that I picked up, I'm not sure where, um, actually, I think from the Cape Breton weather masonettes, um, the what the weather condition is doing or the change between the weather between the two large basins um, will have more of an effect on current and tide in the Bredore Lakes than the actual tide schedule for the ocean. So specifically, this is uh, our friend's boat incognito going through the bridges here at Iona. There's quite a strong tide at Iona, um, but it's not necessarily a predictable tide in, in terms of uh, which way it's flowing and how fast it's going to be flowing. Um, that really does have more to do on uh, with, with uh, uh, a difference between weather systems between the two uh, between the two lakes. Um, as you can imagine, when a low pressure system moves over an area, um, the uh, the average water level will actually rise quite a bit uh, versus a, a high pressure area, which will push down on the water level, um, and that can create this this current effect between the two lakes um, at Iona. Um, and then, of course, what is predictable is the tide in the Great Perdor Channel under the Seal Island Bridge. Um, so what 
is not predictable at Iona is certainly is predictable in other areas. Um, and as any local voter will tell you, um, it's certainly uh, a really good experience to challenge the strength of a marriage to go through the Great Predor Channel at the wrong time uh, and against the tide because you can experience currents uh, well over five, six, seven knots. Um, so that's that's quite a that's quite a current if if uh, if it's against you. Um, and uh, this was uh, my wife on our boat. Our last boat, uh, the J30 Groovin, coming uh, coming into the lakes last year. Um, so I just want to say again, um, you know, the importance of going to community experts, going to the guidebooks, um, but also joining places like Benyon Yacht Club and Marina, um, and getting to know local boaters. Um, community expertise really does matter quite a bit. Um, because you can get a lot of information from Navionics, you can get a lot of information from charts, um, but ultimately knowing uh, the nuances of where to go, where to drop your hook, um, what to experience while you're in different places, that's where a community of boaters really adds so much um, to what the apps are. And as I said at the beginning, apps are really made for a global audience. Um, and so making sure that you're connected to the local community as well can really maximize your enjoyment. Um, this is my son and I on the paddleboard in Maskell's Harbor, uh, a place that we um, never, I, I just skipped over any time that I looked at Navionics until we spoke to some local folks and they said, you need to check this out. And I'm really glad we did. Um, and just as I said before, um, this is uh, down in the Cramon Islands in uh, um, <clears throat> the same night, we had fog on one side, clear on the other side. Um, and this is by Marble Mountain. Um, absolutely gorgeous spot to spend the night. No cell reception to speak of. Um, so, uh, so while there is cell reception, as soon as you get outside of the islands, uh, while we were there, there was nothing. Um, so, and that's something that, uh, that we were forewarned about by the local experts and things that you won't necessarily read in a guidebook or see on Navionics. Um, and another cool feature about the Brodora Lakes, and I always love to tell folks that are not from here about this, is the uh, opportunity to nose up. Uh, we have a lot of really bold shores. Local experts, local uh, boaters will know where these are. You'll find some in Navionics. Um, you won't really, I, I've seen it every so often in one of the guidebooks, um, but really local folks will tell you, especially with a sailboat with a deeper keel, um, where the spots are that you can go and nose up. It's a very fascinating experience to uh, set your anchor in the sand um, as opposed to uh, on the bottom of whatever bay you're staying in and to just hop onto dry land off the nose of a, of a sailboat. Um, but very cool how fast the water drops away and certainly something that's a uniquely Bredore Lake experience. Um, and now my final note on, on navigation. Um, this is really a fairly useless app in the lakes because there's just not enough uh, um, commercial marine activity. Um, but this is a fascinating app that we used when we made our transit from Halifax up the coast. Um, this is called Boat Beacon. And essentially what it does is it turns your phone into an AIS. Now it will only work when you have cell reception. So for that 15 minutes that we lost cell reception, we weren't able to see other boats. But AIS is essentially every commercial vessel has to be registered with AIS. Um, and what it will do is it will, you can click on any boat, you can see what their heading is, their speed is, where their destination is, where they're coming from. Um, and if, if you're going to, or your, your closest point um, to that boat, uh, especially on a foggy night, especially on the coast of Nova Scotia, um, when you get into these uh, multi-ton vessels, hundreds of feet long, uh, you certainly don't want to uh, meet one of those. Uh, they'll win every single time. And so we found this a very comforting app to have running uh, while we while we made the transit up the coast, especially when the fog set in and we couldn't see a single thing. Um, so here you can see what the, uh, the the middle picture there just kind of shows you what it looks like. That there's it shows you all the commercial boats. You can click actually into the boats themselves, and when you click the little information icon, it will usually bring up a picture of the boat as well as, like I mentioned, their heading, their speed. Uh, last location, uh, distance that they've traveled, the name of the boat. Um, so even if you thought that you were going to be close to them, you'd have the name of the vessel that you could call them on the VHF radio if you wanted to, just to let them know that you're there. Um, so certainly a, a really cool app. Um, and I think it was $20 for this app. 
which is a far cry from four or $500 for an AIS system. And if I did a lot more coastal cruising, I may invest in that hardware, but where we're only going to make the, the odd trip here and there, I think this boat beacon app is uh, exactly what we need and certainly uh, saves a little bit on the pocketbook. Okay, uh, I don't know what that is. Error popped up there. Oh my gosh. Sorry about that. Um, uh, okay, so the, the, I lied. Uh, race cues is after this. The dreaded anchor alarm. Um, so this is a really great app to have running if you, if, if you want it. Um, your anchor dragging is certainly something you don't want to happen. It's not very fun at all. Um, and the other thing is, especially if you know that there's a storm coming with a wind shift um, and you're worried about uh, how close you're going to swing into shore um, or if your anchor will hold in a, in a wind shift, really great app to run. Um, my personal experience with this, you do have to remember to open it up as you're dropping your anchor, um, not once your anchor is set. Um, I ended up buying the pro version uh, just because it had a few more um, a few more features for me. I do want to point out here GPS accuracy when I open this up today, 15 meters inside my home. So you can uh, you can see here that even though you should have really good accuracy, um, sometimes it's not great. Um, what I did find was that um, it's hard to find the right settings for every anchorage. And uh, I only use this if I'm really nervous about weather or about um, the, uh, the, the state of the bottom of the, uh, the seabed. Um, and I'm really nervous about dragging because um, otherwise I find this alarm goes off more often than it needs to. And uh, what it does is acts more as a way to prevent me from getting a restful sleep after a long sail. <laughs> um, but uh, on the flip side, I have used it in uh, a fairly stormy night. Um, and I'm glad I had it because it did uh, uh, jolt me awake as the wind was shifting. And I was able to go up and, and make sure that I uh, um, that we were we were safe through the, the wind shift. OK, um, now, of course, my passion, racing, yacht racing. Um, I want to talk about race cues. Race cues is a really fascinating app. Uh, absolutely love it. Um, the the power of race cues is is uh, amazing as it is right now. It's a community of volunteers that 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 put out this uh, amazing app, um, and there's a whole community around it. Um, what you can do is if you take your cell phone and you're running race cues, um, you can tape your cell phone to a flat surface in your boat, um, start tracking, and what it it will do it will track you through your whole race or just to sail if you're out for a practice. And if you actually fix it to your boat, it will. Uh, it will use your um, your phone to measure pitch and roll as well. Um, so afterwards, you can actually replay your uh, your race, and you can you can see how you were doing in terms of healing, um, things like that. So you can really dive in with your crew and say, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? Um, where were we excessively healing? You know, slipping to leeway, whatever it may be. Um, so the the fact that you can track. Um, all of that data and watch a replay is really cool. The other thing is any other boat in your vicinity that's running race queues will show up on the replay. So it's a really great way for clubs to encourage participation. And you can actually live stream. I think there's a 10 minute delay in the position of the boats just so there's no tactical advantage. But you can live stream to a website um, so folks can sit at home and watch all the different yachts uh, racing around the cans. Um, if you get uh, everybody sort of into this. Um, so uh, really cool. You can actually add in all of the different pins. You can add in the start line. You can add in all of your, your race pins. And I'm very excited for 2021 racing season in East Bay because we are going to set permanent pins and have a really good map um, and start to build uh, the, the digital framework around how we can support folks to use some of this technology in that. Um, but what I really, really, really love about race cues um, is the fact that it actually um, can talk to your uh, uh, GPS watch. Specifically, it works with a couple Garmin watches. Um, and that is literally the only reason I bought a Garmin smart, smart watch, so I can use race cues on my app or on my, on my watch. So I can leave my phone tracking down below, measuring the, uh, the heel of the boat. And on my, on my watch, it will tell me my speed but it'll also tell me the distance to the start line. It will tell me my velocity made good towards the next pin, telling me the heading to the next pin. It's a really fascinating tool. 
all on my uh, all on my wrist that I can quickly glance at. Um, and this is all free. I love the fact that this is all free. Um, and I had a little bit of challenge the first time that I set up the uh, Race Queue Sailing Tactics uh, watch application. Um, but it's a developer down in uh, Australia, and he spent a couple hours on the phone with me getting it working. And I got to say, I, I just can't say enough about uh, about that app um, and about the uh, the options that come with it and the, the fact that you can use a smartwatch. Um, and uh, if you look at some of the uh, the instruments that you can get out there for sailing, um, they're extremely expensive. So, uh, especially when you get into the racing stuff. So race cues in my mind is very user friendly um, and, a, and a cheap way to get some really incredibly powerful data to up your racing game. I probably shouldn't be sharing any of this because uh, I do poorly enough as it is in the races, but I don't need to give anybody else an advantage over me. Um, but I did just want to highlight race cues and the website is full of video tutorials. Um, so if there's any aspect that you don't understand about uh, using the app or something you have questions with, I mean, their, their database of tutorials is absolutely breathtaking, um, really easy to follow. So I'd, I'd certainly encourage anybody that's into yacht racing to dive into race cues. Getting towards the end here. And so just a final note on uh, on hardware. Um, so this is uh, the only photo I have of my chart plotter. So I threw it up on there. Um, so my chart plotter, my Raymarine chart plotter is wireless. It can talk to my phone. Um, you can get them set up. So they talk to all your wind instruments, um, talks to your chart plotter, and then you can download all that digitally onto uh, a phone or an iPad or something like that. Um, all of that is, is certainly possible. Um, I would encourage, uh, especially if you're new to the boating community, to use some of the free tools that are out there, or some of the low cost apps that are out there before you dive into the deep end of thousands of dollars in, in hardware, in chart plotters, in you know, uh, updated um, Wi-Fi transmitters for your depth sounder and wind instruments and things like that. Um, uh, most boats will come with some version of that already. Um, and I would certainly encourage people to explore what they are really interested in, the data that they find themselves using, um, and then look at how you can change your hardware to act actually suit your sailing needs, as opposed to just walking in and buying something with the biggest price tag, um, which tends to uh, seem, it seems to happen sometimes. Um, so where our boat, we're only a year into our boat. Um, we know the things that we want to change, but we don't know enough about um, where we want to go with our electronics that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll update the few things that we need to, um, but continue to do our research for, uh, for uh, uh, hardware. Um, the other thing I want to note is all of the apps that I've talked about today, um, they all work on both iOS and Android phones. Um, if uh, um, if you're going to go with a tablet, and tablets are fantastic, I love having a tablet on board. Um, especially, you can get industrial strength Velcro. It's a really great way to stick a large screen iPad um, in several places in the boat um, that you can just follow the data around. If you're running at Navionics or something like that, rainy day, you can stick it down inside the cabin. You can quickly run down and check, um, or a sunny day, have it up up top with you. Um, lots of waterproof cases. The thing I want to highlight about especially tablets uh, is that not all of them come with GPS. So just make sure that that is, is something that, uh, that is ticked off on a tablet before you get it, um, or it will have to be tethered to your phone um, and using your phone's GPS. And I personally like everything that I have to have its own GPS, uh, especially where power management becomes a question because I don't want to have to be constantly recharging everything. Um, and I only have two plugs for, uh, for my uh, phone and iPad. All right, um, and that's, that's the end of the presentation. Um, and I think I'm um, 929, I did it. <laughs> Very good. All right. Very good. Race Q. Race Q, yeah. That's cool, I, I didn't know that one. Yeah, um, it's awesome. We uh, um, started to use it a bit at St. Margaret's Sailing Club. Um, yes when I was down in St. Marcus Bay. So I think we had four or five boats using it a race. And it was really nice. cool because you could, you oh, could yeah. go back and actually post the uh, 
the replay video. Oh, I think that'd be brilliant. That'll yeah. just add. That'll just add to the to the banter after the race. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, you, you don't have to stick your phone to the boat. Um, that only matters if you want to get like the heel yeah. and the yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really cool tool. Yeah. No, that's great. Good job, Andrew. Yeah. Thanks so much. So I'll yeah. um, edit this a little bit. And yep. We'll get it posted. All right. Thanks Take for care. attending, Brian. Okay. Well, my pleasure. It was great. All right. Stay All right. safe. Good night. Okay. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.